So uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, David Mulvihill with the Chicago Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies and uh, the moderator of today's discussion, Working In-House Perspectives from Corporate Counsel. We have an outstanding panel of in-house lawyers joining us this afternoon who will share a bit about their career paths and day-to-day -day experiences corporate counsel, uh, when and why they decided to go in-house, how in-house practice differs from law firm and government practice, and the benefits and challenges of uh, in-house practice. The format of today's panel will be separated into three segments, beginning with the panelists each providing some background on their career path and daily experiences in-house, followed by a moderated panel discussion and concluding with questions from the audience. We ask that you use the Q&A feature in the Zoom interface to submit questions for the panel at any time during today's program. Um, before I get into the introductions, I do want to make a plug uh, for our first um, annual uh, Federalist Society in-house council symposium, which will be held on Saturday, May 14th. Uh, we have keynote speaker Bill Barr uh, and uh, a number of general counsel who will be attending that conference. Uh, there will be more details that will be coming out shortly, uh, so please uh, be on the lookout for an email from the Federalist Society, and you could also go to our in-house counsel um, practice uh, page on the Federal Society National site for further information. We'll be posting uh, information on registration as soon as that's available. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel today. Uh, Alexandra Harrison Gaser uh, is the Director of Regulatory Affairs at River Financial. Prior to joining River, Alexandra was the Executive Secretary at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, where she worked directly with Secretary Mnuchin and managed all regulations, official correspondence, and intra, intra and interagency coordination. She was previously an associate at Aiken, Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld LLP's Washington, D.C. office. Ms. Gaser holds a degree in politics, philosophy, and economics from the King's College and a JD from the University of Texas. She clerked for then Justice Allison H. Ede on the Colorado Supreme Court and Judge Jennifer W. Elrod on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Kyle Dolan is general counsel and a certified NFL agent at Priority Sports, a full service sports agency in Chicago. Prior to his time at Priority, Kyle worked at a multinational law firm. He is a graduate of the Ohio State University and the University of Chicago Law School, and currently resides in the Chicago suburbs with his wife and their five children. Mark Schumann is Vice President and Associate General Counsel at American Equity Life, a leader in fixed index and fixed rate annuities that's building a stronger emphasis on insurance liability-driven asset allocation, specializing in private asset management. Mark's practice covers all public company matters, including SEC disclosure and public communications, securities, capital markets activity, corporate governance, and executive compensation. Mark is in his 25th year of in-house practice in financial services and his 34th year of active Federalist Society membership he is a former secretary of the Society's New York Lawyers Chapter and a current member of the Society's in-house Working Group Leadership Committee. And finally, Dennis Moroshko is co-founder and president of Degree Insurance, a startup that works to give students confidence to graduate from college by guaranteeing their salaries. He has previously served as general counsel to an Illinois governor, was an appellate attorney at Jones Day, clerked for two federal court of appeals and worked as an actuarial consultant before law school. Dennis has degrees from Maryville University of St. Louis and Northwestern University School of Law. And before we begin, I would like to preemptively share the obligatory disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed by each of our panelists are solely their own and do not represent those of their respective employers or the Federalist Society. 
And with that out of the way, I'm going to turn the floor over to Alexandra. Yeah, thanks so much, David. So I never planned to go in-house. It uh, came as a bit of a, a surprise, albeit a pleasant one. Um, so I was a, a sort of happy and very normal litigator. I was on the path. So I had a couple of appellate clerkships right out of law school. Um, and then I went to a big international law firm. I was in their DC office. Um, I was quite happy there and, and sort of assumed I would stay there for the foreseeable future. And then out of the blue, I got an email from the then Deputy General Counsel of the US Treasury saying, had I considered some executive branch service and gee, would I like to come to Treasury? Uh, and at that point, I almost didn't go interview. Um, and my wonderful husband talked me into it basically by bribing me that I had not seen the inside of the US Treasury and wouldn't I like to check that off my list. Um, so I, I ended up going, I interviewed with them, we hit it off, um, a couple of things changed at the firm. And so it ended up making sense for me to go to Treasury. And that was really what I consider to be my first in-house experience. Um, it was government, but my one and only client was the U.S. Treasury. And so I spent um, about a year and a half in the general counsel's office doing a lot of in-house work, kind of anything that, that came in, whether it was high profile or uh, really jejun and, and unexciting. And then I transitioned over to the senior staff side and was the executive secretary, which I like to describe as sort of the, the air traffic control or the COO role um, of a major agency. So you, you control the paper is the DC speak for what I did there. Um, it's like the staff secretary at the White House. Um, but that was really good in terms of getting to manage something and see a lot of different departments work together. So again, that was really valuable experience for going in-house. Um, and both of those experiences led me to realize I liked solving a lot of different problems for one client, much more than I liked solving one type of problem for a lot of clients. And so coming out of Treasury, I was looking for in-house work um, ideally in the financial services sector. I liked the business component of kind of in-house work and, and financial services. And I ended up at a Bitcoin company. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not the general counsel. I'm not a deputy general counsel. I'm the director of regulatory affairs, but particularly for a startup that's in a an industry where the regulation is changing quite a bit, I play a lot of the same, same roles. So I think a lot about uh, detailing accurately what the risk assessment is on any given activity. So I work with really smart people. They've got really good ideas. And my job is basically to tell them that is a great idea. It has a level 10 out of 10 risk that we're going to get uh, regulated or in trouble um, versus like a, a six or seven versus like a two or three. Um, and ultimately that's gonna go to either the engineering side uh, because we're a tech company or it's going to go to sort of the, the business decision-making side. But it's important to be able to understand both the law and the regulatory atmosphere and then um, provide that really succinctly for uh, my client, which is also my employer. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Kyle. Thanks so much. I think like Alexandra, and I wonder how often we'll hear this today. I um, also never pictured myself going in-house and, and becoming a general counsel for a company. As David mentioned, I'm general counsel for Priority Sports. We're a sports agency here in Chicago, uh, representing both football and basketball players and then coaches in both of those sports as well. So by way of background, I similarly was working at a large law firm for uh, several years out of law school. Um, unlike Alexandra, I was quite bad at it. I think if you asked many of the people who interacted with me then, um, it, it really, I was not cut out for uh, that line of work. I was doing primarily uh, corporate work, um, but at the time knew that eventually I would want to uh, potentially make a leap into a smaller firm and, and hopefully have enough diversity of experience to work with I really wanted to work with sports clients. So ultimately that was kind of my goal and, and working towards that. 
after several years, um, it was, it was kind of by happenstance. I had several friends who I had mentioned my desire to work in the world of sports. I, I'd grown up playing and then coached in high school ball prior to uh, becoming an attorney. So I had several friends forward me a posting for um, an NFL agent job. It involved mostly background operations work at Priority. And by operations, I mean kind of the contract analytics, the numbers, how do you value contracts? How do you structure contracts for uh, football players particularly? So I, at the time, thought, well, agency life doesn't seem right for me, but uh, I may as well speak to these guys. So to make a long story short, I, I got involved in talking to these guys about a job that was not legal really in any sense. Um, now, they knew my legal background, and as we got to talking more, they said, well, would you be willing to take on a little bit of the legal work? We're a little overwhelmed in, in a couple of areas here. So when I started, I was both recruiting football players to represent in NFL contract negotiations while also handling just a, a really a minuscule amount of marketing work. And what that marketing work entails is primarily, it, everyone knows the phrase now actually, name image likeness, because we see these college athletes able to uh, uh, capitalize on their name image and likeness. Well, one of the ways that our clients have always been able to as professional athletes is uh, selling the rights to utilize their name, image, and likeness. So I got involved in um, protecting those in the contracts, both at contract formation and as we, you know, continue down the path, a lot of those are long lasting um, relationships and, and making sure that we're adhering by, you know, what we said to begin with. Um, like Alexandra said, I, I find a lot of excitement from we're in an incredibly changing landscape, the world of sports. So and the, the marketing space, as I mentioned, the collegiate athletes can now capitalize on name, image, and likeness. And it seems like every week there's a new uh, state coming down with a regulation or something to try to um, control that behavior and make sure that the athletes are protected. So that's a, a portion still of my day-to-day -day work is dealing with name, image, likeness. And in fact, you know, this is a big week for us um, with the Super Bowl going on. We have a lot of athletes doing appearances down here. Um, I'm actually out in Los Angeles. I'm at the hotel now. So that's really a, a huge, huge piece of the year. And one of the things that I've quite enjoyed about being in-house is the cyclical nature of the work that, you know, I might not do a ton of marketing work throughout most of January, but then as we get into Super Bowl, that stuff starts to heat up and, and, uh, we protect a lot of that. And then next week we'll have the NBA All-Star Game where we have similar, um, you know, similar, similar level of involvement, albeit for basketball instead of football. Uh, so, I, I, you know, that part of my practice is great and I, I enjoy doing that work. But as I grew into that role, there started to be more and more um, opportunities to work on kind of the legal language in the NFL contracts in NBA contracts and in coaching contracts. Now, most of those aside from coaching basketball and football are based upon a form that the league gives you. And, and in some ways that reminded me of some of my uh, law firm practice where I was, you know, the, the minutia of going through kind of line by line, but where football differs incredibly is that once you get into the, you know, other than the dollars and cents of the thing, it's the wild West, the, the addendums and what you can, you know, how you can guarantee money, how you can structure money, those sort of things. Those are really important and those are not heavily regulated. Now there's a collective bargaining agreement that restricts certain, you know, things we could do in one direction or the other, but to a large extent, um, those are, you know, we, we can be pretty creative there. So I've had a lot of fun over the years um, being able to get more involved in that space uh, some of the bigger deals we've done include Kirk Cousins, and Mike Evans, where, you know, Kirk was the first ever fully guaranteed contract. And, and I think we had a lot of, frankly, it was a lot of fun working through that process to get to that point. And ultimately, kind of our theories on what would happen if we ever hit the market with a top level quarterback uh, were proven true, both in a financial sense, but also in the sense that we could structure this thing um, the way we wanted to and the way that was beneficial to our players. And then the third piece of uh, being in-house, and I, I don't think I'm missing any, but potentially one will come up in the Q&A session, is managing outside uh, counsel and 
for us, ultimately, that's that's usually when we don't have um, expertise in an area, for example, intellectual property, uh, trademarks, that sort of thing that recently a lot of athletes have wanted to have their own trademark logo and all these things to be able to brand it. And we need to be able to work with counsel at A, making sure that the trademark is rock solid, but B, that the timing lines up when we're doing deals with their ultimate, usually it's their shoe company, um, to, to make sure that we can grant that right and license the logo out to the company to then make items featuring um, those logos. So we manage that council. Sometimes we get involved on the real estate level. Unfortunately, now we're, we're blessed in that we have a great client list from a character standpoint, but unfortunately, often we do wind up managing, um, not often, but occasionally uh, some criminal matters. If players get in legal trouble, a, a DUI is a frequent one. We're going to want to be involved with their criminal counsel in part because the financial ramifications for the player are uh, exceedingly high, particularly in the football context. So making sure that whatever the criminal counsel is doing, we're fully evaluating, okay, is this the right step for our guy and protecting him both professionally and personally? So um, yeah, unfortunately we have good relationships with a lot of the those attorneys who handle that line of work and make sure that we work with them closely. And then my final piece would be um, uh, my, I, I joke with my friends, I have a burgeoning appellate practice. Uh, and by that, I mean, when players get fined, we appeal the fines and deal with those uh, uh, situations with the mediators on the league side and uh, ultimately, you know, represent our guys throughout the, that process. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's, it's not actual appellate work, but um, uh, yeah, take a lot of pride in being able to save some money for our guys over the years. And, and I think that's worked out well. So um, at the risk of being too long winded, I think that's, Kind of long and the short of it. I look forward to answering some questions later, and I do appreciate everyone uh, uh, being here today. So I think I think next up is Mark, unless I'm mistaken. I I can take it next. It's fine. Great. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. So um, thanks everybody for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, it's our pleasure to speak to you and, and hopefully uh, give you some some insights on what it's like to be in-house and move in-house. Um, I think it, if, if my remarks had a theme, it would be uh, if you're in-house, you're in a different business than you are outside. You may use some of the same skills, but it's a different business model. Uh, what you do is different. How you succeed is different. What success looks like um, is different. So a little bit about my career path. I was um, at one time, a commercial litigator I was really interested in employment law, uh, and I became an employment litigator. Um, and what I what I found about employment litigation was I loved practicing employment law. I really did not like litigation. Um, I very much enjoyed when I got a chance to um, advise on employee relations matters, on transactions. But at a law firm, there's a limited opportunity to do that. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to do litigation, which can involve arguing for arguing sake, ad hominem nastiness, um, not, not, not my cup of tea. So I actually went looking um, for an in-house position. I thought, if, given what I like to do, that, uh, that that would be a good move for me. And I called some headhunters. Um, fortunately, one of, them, one of them called me back. And I, I went in-house to MetLife in, in New York City. Um, and I will tell you that, that um, joining MetLife and going in-house um, really changed my life for the better. Um, immediately, I was a lot happier with my life and what I was doing. Um, still very busy. Going in-house does not mean you're not very busy, um, but it feels different, especially if what you're looking for is the feeling of being product productive and creating and protecting value, um, creating partnerships over time rather than um, getting your, your client through the transaction or through the, or through the litigation. Um, and that was, that was a, a lot of fun. And I spent about 10 years as an employment lawyer, deepening my practice, not only in employment law, uh, but also in executive compensation and eventually M&A, uh, where when, when we did M&A at MetLife, which was fairly frequent, um, I was usually 
a human resources lawyer on the M&A deal. And I found those to be in incredibly satisfying, um, very interesting, always complex. Uh, and, you know, I thought I thought my life was pretty good. Uh, then my boss called me into um, his office um, in, in January of 08 and said, I I've got a new assignment for you. You're moving over here to uh, the public company lawyers. You're going to be a securities lawyer. And uh, oh, by the way, you're you're leading and managing the team. So that was my introduction to a complete shift in in my career. And that sometimes happens uh, in house. Sometimes you seek it. And sometimes it sometimes it seeks you. I was pretty shocked. Uh, by this. Um, I ran into one of my friends after that meeting and and she, she was convinced I'd been fired. Uh, she said, you know, it's going to be okay. You're a good lawyer. Um, that's how shocked and, and taken aback I was. It, it turned out, of course, to be um, something that is has been really great for me. And I'm eternally grateful to my boss at the time and to MetLife for giving me that opportunity. Um, I had to learn a lot of things um, that were not just new to being an in-house lawyer, but new to um, being a manager of lawyers and a leader of lawyers and a leader of legal assistants. That's um, a skill set that is incredibly important to ultimately more and more success in-house that is not always emphasized at law firms. I think at law firms, it, it's not necessarily a skill that is selected for. It's not necessarily rewarded um, whereas in-house, it is absolutely essential. So if it's something that you're interested in being a leader and being a, a good leader and a good manager, um, in-house, uh, if you're good at that and you're sure you're good at that, you can be rewarded for that in a way that you might not be, um, might not be at a firm. So here I was, I had to learn how to lead, I had to learn how to manage, and I had to learn securities law. Um, I knew a little bit about it, but not really a lot, just just some. So that was a, a pretty big hill to climb. Um, those of you who remember 2008, that was not necessarily a quiet time in securities law, in finance, in markets. That made it a very interesting time to have to learn all three of those things. But I, I wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Uh, you know, we did we did an equity offering to the market. Um, in October of 08, when the market was just falling all over the place. We did that in the span of three days, what usually is done in about three weeks. That was incredibly, incredibly exciting. And I learned, you know, I learned a lot. Um, you know, uh, eventually, uh, I guess one of the things I learned when, uh, about, being, about being a leader that, that surprised me was, you know, at the time I thought, well, a leader or manager always knows more about everything than any team member does. You know, whatever team member knows, the manager or the leader will know more about that subject. And that's absolutely untrue, um, especially in-house. If you know more about everything that the, than your team does, you're not doing your job right. Um, your team should know more than you about most things. Um, otherwise, you're not giving them enough challenges, you're not relying on them enough, and um, you're, not do, you're not doing your job, you're not developing their talent as well. So. After about 25 years in MetLife, I, I got the sense I'd sort of hit a plateau there. And um, I was speaking with a friend of mine who um, ended up becoming chief legal officer at American Equity about uh, possibly working together um, as we had at MetLife a few years earlier. And that's really worked out in incredibly well for me. It's an amazing opportunity to work for a smaller company, dynamic, um, building a lot of things that at a Fortune 500 company existed well before I got there and existed long after I left. But at American Equity, we have to build those things because the company is really transforming itself into something new and exciting. And it's, it's really exciting to be part of that. So a little bit about my work day. Um, my work day is often mainly meetings and preparing for meetings. Um, I, I think as an in-house attorney, that's been typical of my experience, maybe others. Um, you spend a lot of time in meetings. So um, being able to run an efficient meeting, to attend in a meeting and a meeting and know how to be effective in it can be really important. Um, when the time that you're not in meetings, you're you're dealing with emergencies, things that have come up, your, you know, your manager calls you, your boss calls you, your, the chief legal officer calls you, the chief financial officer calls you, and it's, well, this is important and it needs to be done right now. And your to-do list, you know, you you put aside. Um, 
other things come up, not necessarily from senior management, but also that are, are clearly something that has to be attended to right away. Then you, you look at, at your to-do list at the, um, at the end of the day, and you realize you may have gotten to one or two things that you plan to, um, but you've had an incredibly productive and, and useful day. Um, you have to be flexible with your to-do list as a result. If you say, well, today I'm going to do X, has to be done, I'm going to shut out everything, that does, in my experience, that does not work in-house. The only time you get to do that is times that you can turn off email and, and phone calls, which is not most, is not most business days. So um, usually then by the end of the day, after looking at the to-do list and rearranging it for the next day, um, it, it's also time to plan for the next few days. What do I have coming up? What meetings do I have that I have to be ready for? What do I have to do to be responsive to the things that I've, I've committed people to do within a certain amount of time? You know, in terms of being in-house, my, what I found was the schedule is just as busy, but it is more predictable in some ways and more flexible. What I mean predictable is if you decide as an in-house lawyer, I'm going to take vacation this or that week, you, you'll almost certainly be able to take it. It doesn't mean you won't be able, you won't have to do some work while you're on vacation, but it's very rare that you'll have to cancel uh, a vacation. The flexibility in terms of hours was was immediate. And of course, after the pandemic has, has really even expanded um, beyond that. If you are in-house, a key skill is prioritization. Um, and, and you have got to learn to do that for yourself. Your boss can't do that for you because your boss, unlike in some law firm's environment, is not micromanaging you or shouldn't be. So at any given time when you're in-house, you could be busy on anything, on any number of things. There's not a lack of work to do. What you conclude is most important to spend time on and prioritize is an extraordinarily important skill for being a good in-house lawyer. And that has to develop over time. Communication when you're in-house is different. Um, you have to be much more succinct. Um, nobody pays you to do legal analysis per se. They, they pay you to give good advice and to give advice that is practical. Um, unlike in litigation or maybe even in law school, the legal analysis, if you consider that fun, I do. That's great, but you do that as a stand, as a setup for exercising your judgment and giving good business oriented um, advice. It's very rare that you can uh, go down a rabbit hole into very very deep depths on a particular issue. It happens, but it, it's it's rare. And um, the reason for that is there are too many issues. You need to get the expertise you need from others. You need to understand it um, well enough to to give advice and to give next steps. Um, and of course, as we talked about, managing others um, is is a um, privilege that, um, if you do well, is very valuable in-house. You know, I think um, to sum up, I would say a big difference is when you're in-house, you're a cost center, you're overhead, you're not a profit center. When you're at a law firm, you know, you're in the business of practicing law. Uh, when you're in-house, you're not in the business of practicing law. You're in the business of your employer and getting that done. What you do is instrumental, very important, but ultimately it's, it's overhead. And what happens to overhead is it gets squeezed for efficiency, for stretch and, and flexibility. Those are the things you have to be able to exhibit to succeed in-house. It's a different business, maybe some of the same skills. Um, I think we can go to the next panelist. Um, hope you enjoyed these comments and look forward to the questions. All right, I think that's uh, that's up to me. Mark, you should, uh, oh, you're gone. I was gonna say, you should stay on video because I just realized that this format, what it does is it like, it makes you feel like you're talking to a mirror, which is great for like self affirmations and how wonderful you are every morning when you stand like doing brushing your teeth and whatever. But it's uh, it just has that unfortunate effect. So I'm I'm just gonna really hope that you like all of you listening to this thing paid no attention to what the other three people said because it's gonna be a lot of re repetition for the last guy to go because it's all the same stuff, right? Like, I mean, look, I mean, just to to emphasize things, Alexandra was exactly right. Kyle too. Um, yeah. You're sitting there in a the law firm and you have a plan because you're going to work so many years, you're going to make partner, you're going to have this wonderful existence, and you're going to retire happily ever after, after like 20 or 30 or 40 years of doing that. And all of a sudden, somebody knocks on your door and said, you know, have you considered this? So in my case, I was a happy appellate lawyer. I was, um, you know, I went to law school to be an appellate nerd. 
like this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to write legal briefs and like argue cases to judges and, and have them tell me how wrong I am. And it's just fun. Nobody else thinks it's fun, but I thought it was fun. So that's what I was going to do for the rest of my career. And then there's a governor in Illinois who gets elected and <clears throat> it's, it's exciting. And I'm thinking, I want to go work for him. And everybody in the law firm says, you're making the biggest mistake of your life because you're two years out of partner, right? So you should really nose down, work hard, bill a lot of hours, make partner, and then you can leave and do your sabbatical for a couple of years because then you can come back to a law firm. So don't leave now. That's like the worst thing you can do to yourself. And I thankfully didn't listen to them because it occurred to me that in two years, um, the governor's administration is going to be a very different administration. He's going to push out the exciting stuff in the first couple of years. And then in the second half of his term, it's going to be a different thing. It happens the same at the federal government level. So being there at the start is super exciting. And that's and that's what I did. And then haven't really looked back, despite the traditional advice of, you know, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. So when you have a plan as a young lawyer, just be, be ready for the fact that that plan may have to get thrown out the window because there's a better plan and you can kind of just follow in a different direction. And that's leaving the government experience is when I had this amazing opportunity to, to form the startup that I'm running right now with my friend, where we had an idea for a new insurance product. And it turns out that maybe all of my career choices to this point really like made me ideal for one job and one job only, which is build new insurance companies and nothing else. Like I can do nothing else with my life. Everything else is going to be awful, but I can build new insurance companies because I'm, I'm an actuary and a lawyer, which makes me like super popular cocktail parties, I think. Um, everybody wants to talk to a guy who does numbers and, and law. But that's paradoxically like is what makes me well suited for, for this job where I, I'm the president of the company, but there's no other lawyers. So I wear the general counsel hat and I'm also like the chief actuary and the data scientist, which means I have the, I have a really good insight into what the business of the company needs. And as Mark was pointing out, like no business in the United States, with, with a few exceptions, gets formed with this understanding that, oh, let's go and really immerse ourselves in a bunch of legal issues. Like nobody cares about that on the business side. And the business side wants to sell product or sell services. There's like two things and we want to make a gobble out of money. And we, we really wish like law didn't exist because it just stops us from doing a whole bunch of fun things that we want to do. So <laughs> the challenge then for the general counsel in that setting is how do, you, how do you move forward in the direction that the business wants to go? And how do you clear the playing field, so to speak? Because there's a spectrum of issues, right? Like every single business decision is going to be up against what Alexandra called it, like, like level 10 risk, level six, level, level two. I'm a, I'm a much simpler person. So I, I view it as like there's the orange jumpsuit violations where you go to prison and somebody pays for your like a nice cell and gives you several meals a day. And there's the other part of the spectrum, which is you just get to do whatever you want because there's no law that occupies that field. And the challenge, of course, is the general counsel's job at a typical company is going to be that you're very much in between. And you're going to have to figure out based on what the business side wants to do, here is the parameters and here is kind of the lane that you operate in. And you do it against the backdrop of what Mark described well, which is your cost center. Like nobody says, oh, it's wonderful that we have lawyers here. <laughs> um, we are a necessary evil. We have to exist. Like the, the society is complex. There's a lot of laws out there. And that's what we do. So in terms of my day to day, so what, what, what do I actually do when I show up and act as a lawyer? There's a couple of buckets. Think of them as the, there's the mundane bucket, the boring stuff, but super important. And then there's the exciting stuff, the like cutting edge. Like you really want to be spending all of your time doing that. The mundane stuff that's super important is it's your contract review. It's your non-disclosure agreements. It's your employment matters. If you do that stuff wrong, you could really hurt your company in a very, very serious way. So as boring as it is, like nobody loves review and like there's some people who love review and contracts. They're special. If you find those people, you'll hold on to them because like that doesn't happen very often. Um, don't let them go, like keep them, like hold on to them. Um, but most people don't like review and contracts, but it's super important. It has to be done. Like it's, it's really critical to what it is that you, the value that you bring to your enterprise. So there's, there's that host of tasks. What you really want to do is shift as quickly as you can to the parts that are in the uncharted territory. It's like I run a Bitcoin company and nobody like nobody knows about crypto. I mean, you may think we're 10 plus years into it, but 
the, the federal government, all the different agencies, like they still haven't figured out what to do with it. Like nobody, nobody knows. And that's Bitcoin, which is, which people know a lot about. Take it all the way down to coins that nobody's ever heard about. And we, we have no idea what to do with that. In my world, I run an insurance company that has a product that hasn't existed before, which means I get to figure out a whole bunch of new things that nobody's ever thought about before. And it means working with outside counsel on insurance matters. It actually occurred to me that like, Mark is much more suited to doing what I do because he knows about ins- like being a lawyer in an insurance company. Uh, Kyle deals with sports issues. I have to figure out how I can introduce my product as an NIL name, image, and likeness type of offer to you know two players out there. So I had to learn about what NIL meant because that wasn't a big part of my life up until about a year ago. I need to know about the Alston decision that came from the Supreme Court that says the athletic department now get to spend dollars without you know NCAA restrictions that existed before because now it's antitrust violation and all of a sudden NCAA doesn't get as much deference as it used to wasn't part of my life until a year ago now it is and that's really like that's the excitement of being a general counsel um, and that's true for associate GCs deputy GCs you just you, you may have more of a lane in which you operate but the job by and large doesn't change because you're if you do your job well, you have to pay attention to everything else that's out there. Like the large set of issues that's on your table is not really defined by, well, I'm an employment counsel for this company. So all I care about is employment matters. That actually makes for a very ineffective employment counsel because you're kind of blind to a whole bunch of other things that are going on. So that to me is the, that's the exciting part about the day to day. And I think I can probably stop there, David, if you want to go back to your, um, the, the questions that you have for us. If we still have that, I'll, I'll just keep talking, Jules. Uh, no, just trying to uh, figure out how to uh, reactivate my uh, video, but uh, thank you, Dennis. Uh, so now that we've become acquainted uh, with our panel, uh, we can dive into some more specific questions and issues uh, related to their practice. Uh, before we do so, I did want to remind everyone, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom interface to ask us questions. We will have some time reserved at the end of the call uh, to do uh, audience uh, questions. So uh, please use that function and submit uh, at any time. Uh, So with that, uh, let's begin uh, uh, the panel discussion. And uh, the first question that we have is, uh, can you tell us uh, what some of the most significant differences are between in-house practice and your prior experience either in the law firm world or the government sector. Uh, And uh, Alexandra, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think everyone has touched on this. Everyone is completely correct. Um, I would sort of break it down a little further into a a visual table, right? So we'll go law firm, government, in-house, and look at sort of the the type of work that you're going to do, and then the way that you're going to be rewarded or tracked for doing that type of work. So at a law firm, it's all about legal analysis, and you are tracking billable hours, right? And so Dennis talked about like the boring parts and the exciting parts of your job. I think at a law firm, it's sort of the boring parts and the prestigious parts, Right. And so you've got to bill hours and log your time and all of that is kind of boring. And maybe you're doing site checking, especially if you're someone more junior or you're supervising a bunch of junior attorneys, if you're someone kind of in the middle. And the there just isn't a lot of exciting work because you're in the business of law, Um, but there is prestigious work. And so maybe it's working on a particular type of matter. Maybe it's getting to argue in court, um, particularly if you're in an appellate practice, maybe it's working with a particular partner or a particular client. But I think that's kind of the trade-off there is you're billing hours, you're making a lot of money, um, but it, it really matters how long did it take you to do that? And doing things quickly is not necessarily the goal. So you're writing legal memos, you're creating legal documents. Um, In the government, I think uh, the type of work you do might be significantly more varied. So obviously a line attorney at DOJ is going to do something very different than the general counsel at the FHFA, right? Um, So there's a 
there are a lot of different types of jobs, but typically you're doing some sort of combination of law and policy or law and regulation, um, maybe some enforcement. And there, government is very much what I call a butt in chair sort of exercise, right? And so you're tracked not really by how much you do. There's not really a profit center. Maybe if you're a prosecutor, it you're tracked based on number of case wins or how many criminals you put away that year. But for the most part, you're tracked by how many hours you're about to spend in your chair in your office. So you need to get in by 8.30. You can leave probably sometime after 5.30 or 6, but they really care about the time you're logged on in the remote world or the time that you're in the building, sort of in the physical presence world. Being in-house is completely different. So everybody has sort of talked about this. Um, you are typically like the shorter and less existent your legal work product is, the better and happier everyone is, right? And so in at my company, we're a Bitcoin company. I think every day it's a continual mystery to people that there isn't a listicle on buzzfeed.com of like, here's what you're allowed to do with Bitcoin, right? And I'm sort of every day get to explain again that that's why I have a job. And like, if they have an idea, I can, I'm sort of red light, yellow light, green light it for them, but there's no magic list of do's or don'ts, right? So it's very diverse. Um, I get asked questions about tax law and securities law um, in a sort of internally. And then I do a lot of external facing um, with regulators and other folks in the government. Um, so I, I like to think of my job as a lot of translation. Um, but again, anytime somebody's asking you a question, uh, you're very happy because it means they didn't just go off and do it without asking. Uh, and the, the time they needed the answer was like an hour ago or yesterday. And so I think um, someone mentioned you do the legal analysis to guide your judgment. You don't do the legal analysis because anyone cares about the legal analysis. So that is very different. Um, but I think the way things are tracked in-house is the best. It's did you do your job today? Uh, did everything that needed to get done get done, right? And so that is frequently a lot of emergencies. So um, I think that's, again, that's sort of the nice thing. If you ever need really in-depth legal analysis on something highly specific, you hire outside counsel. So there's always the option to like sort of pay a lot of money and punt this to another lawyer, um, which means you're doing a combination of have to happen boring tasks and have to happen putting out fires. So it's very fast paced. It's geared towards the bottom line or depending on your growth stage, if you're in a startup like I am, um, you know, maybe attracting investors, something else, but it's, it's a very diverse practice um, and a lot of it is very urgent and, and simply can't be put off until tomorrow. So I think it's a great job if you are prone to procrastination because every day is the last possible day to turn in a project uh, in-house. But once you're done, you're done. And no one cares if you've billed eight hours or four hours, no one cares uh, if you logged in and did all your work at two in the morning, uh, did you get it done? Were you available when people needed you? That's really kind of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would add that that just in time aspect to the practice. Um, there's some of that in in some of that in litigation when it's okay. We need to go into court and get an injunction, but but. In, in in-house, it's much more like, you know, everything is now done. I just need to make sure that legally I'm not going to go to jail or it's okay. And part of the art of being in-house is saying, yes, you're, you're okay if you can. Part of it is saying, but you know, when down the road, when this and that happens, you're, you're digging a hole for yourself. Maybe we can also achieve it, you know, something, you know, this, this other way. So oftentimes it's it's just in time because if you don't um, speak up and raise something, um, their, their business people are going to go ahead and do what they want. And what they'll be able to say later is, well, I talked to the lawyer and I, I, the lawyer was, was fine. So I went ahead. Being a good partner to a business person in that situation is is a key part of 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 being, you know, of being in-house. Um, 
and personally, when I was outside, um, it, there, there wasn't so much of that. Okay, we got a motion. We got to file for a motion in three days. We're going to get the return. Um, you know, we're going to take this deposition. It's going to be got to prepare for it. It was a, it was a different, you know, a different vibe. Um, there's also not a lot of not a lot of time to do research when the business people come to you. Um, you you sometimes can say, you know what, I got to give that some thought. Can I get back to you a little later today? If you're lucky, you get that. Um, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's, um, you know, tell me, is this is this OK to do? Because we got this deal. We want to close it. If we don't if we don't get this done in the next hour, we're, we may not be able to do it. And you have to use your judgment to either buy more time if you can give the best advice that you can get the right resources all while the business person is is trying to get business done and you're there to help that business person get you know get business done uh that's a lot of what it's like and i would add um as i said before you could have woken up that day started work and had no idea that that issue was coming to you until it did no no idea that it was coming or that you'd have you know to resolve it on that discussion or maybe you'd get an hour if you're lucky to to take a look at some things and get back to the uh, to the business partner there's a there's an interesting thread on this question of um how quickly you have to provide answers and we so when i was general counsel to the governor we started doing this with our lawyers where i i told them everybody should go and read the book thinking fast and slow by daniel kahneman which is it's like behavioral behavioral psychology and, and how people think in general. And I, I said, our job as in-house counsel is to fight for our right to slow down because everybody else is coming at you really fast and they want decisions instantly. What they want you to do is they want you to react. And it turns out that like in, in every walk of life, it's very dangerous to go to that level of thinking because there's a lot of biases and you, you actually make a lot of bad decisions. In law in particular, it could be quite detrimental to the actual enterprise of the company. So I, I used to think in government, what, like the communications people are the worst offenders because they live in the Twitter world and there's a, there's a tweet from somebody else that they have to respond to. And it's about a lawsuit that involves the governor. And so you have to really quickly think and, and the, the, the effectiveness of your job depends on your ability to actually educate everybody else on your team as to, uh, and on the other sides of the like the policy shop, the communication shop, the legislative shop, this is in the governor's office. And you have to explain why it actually serves them no purpose to say, give me an answer now. No, you cannot have five minutes to think, but you actually have to protect your ability to sit back and think for at least a little bit. I mean, Mark and Alexandra are right. Like you don't have, uh, give me a couple of months. I'll put together a nice, beautiful legal analysis. Like nobody cares about that. But at the same time, you cannot, like, you cannot fall into the strap of, you're the reactive thinker who gives the instinct response, the instinctual response, and, and that's it. And that's the end of it. Like you have to fight for your right when you're effective in-house counsel for the opportunity to slow down somehow. And it's not going to be easy and nobody's going to like it because nobody thinks of you as like, yeah, you're the value add. Everybody thinks you're cost center, but you have to educate your stakeholders, like your, your business team, the in the government side, all the other areas of the operations, you have to educate them on what it is that you're there for. And if all you're being, if all they want from you is just like a gut reaction, basic, basic instinct, that's not legal analysis. Great. Um, if there's uh, no further input on that question, I think we can move to the next one. Um, how has the fallout from the pandemic uh, impacted your practice? such as remote working, the great resignation, and interfacing remotely with internal and external parties. So Kyle, I'm gonna lob that one at you. Sure, so, you know, the, the great resignation as we're calling it, um, we, did, we did lose some employees to that. We fortunately didn't lose anybody out of our legal department. Now, one of the things that we did was go back and revisit Okay, what what types of policies should we put into play from an HR perspective to either retain employees in those situations or um, at least create accommodations that you know maybe we won't be as impacted by this in the future. Um, fortunately, we were able to uh, overcome a lot of that. But remote working has impacted my practice immensely. So when when the world shut down. Um, and everybody started working from home. One of the points that I think Mark made earlier was you don't, you never really get the 
opportunity to just, hey, I need an hour here and I'm going to lock in. When we're remote working, you kind of can, because that's the only time, you know, when I'm in the office, I always feel like I'm on call. Anybody can pop in at any point and it's one off questions. Hey, this is going on. Is that okay? Hey, th- here's how we're doing this. Does that go with you? And that's the, that's the little more, hey, that's going to pull me away from the work I wanted to do. With remote work, I always felt like, okay, as long as I see what's popping up on email and I'm not letting issues uh, linger too long, I can really tackle uh, whatever it is that's in front of me. So that was kind of a welcome change to some extent. Uh, as far as inter- interfacing with internal and external parties, uh, that's actually a big part of what we do, right? My, the part of my practice that involves counseling with our clients and, and even soliciting new business from clients, uh, it, was, it was quite convenient to have that go remote and to be able to interact with these guys and you know, have meetings with people in multiple states on the same day and kind of take away the value of um, some of that in-person uh, communication. So uh, to that extent, it's, it's largely been good. Now, the sports world was, was very disrupted from a revenue standpoint. Um, and one of the things that's happened as a result of that is the way that we have had to structure certain contracts has, has uh, required a little more delayed compensation and things of that nature. Uh, to make sure that these companies get their revenue and teams revenue up to snuff again uh, before they're paying that money out. And also, you know, I, I think four years ago, force majeure clauses in uh, marketing contracts were something that unless it was taking place in Kansas or California, and I'm thinking there's a tornado or an earthquake, I'm, I'm probably not paying much attention to it. And all of a sudden, every contract we have has, you know, all these force majeure clauses come into play. And Thankfully, we, we actually had fought for some favorable language in a couple of those cases, um, but that's definitely changed forward uh, looking to make sure that A, whatever's, whatever gets disrupted because of COVID, we know exactly settled expectation what we're looking at, and B, forward looking, hey, this might not be the last time something like this happens, so let's make sure we're, we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's with respect to force majeure, which which again, I, I don't mean to pay short shrift. That just wasn't that wasn't something that was of particular importance to us ahead of time. So, in in those respects, um, the fallout of the pandemic has changed day to day life quite a bit. I, I think for me personally, it's it's largely been for, from a professional standpoint, it's largely been to the positive because again, working remotely allows me to control how dialed in I am on any you know one particular issue at a time. So, I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that. Yeah, I, I would I would say, Kyle, that um, there there are times. I, I think I, I I agree with you in this respect. First of all, the pandemic has been terrible and horrible, and I would never want to live through it ever again. The rem, the shift to remote working, on the other hand, has made a big difference. Um, before the pandemic, you know, I was spending uh, fifteen hours a day just getting to the office. I had that 15 hours and and frankly and more back to actually spend time doing to doing work. So to me, it's it's been a well and other things in my life. Occasionally, I do other things than work. Um, so in, in in my experience, it's made things incredibly more efficient because that 15 hours was com- complete waste, complete waste of time, and yet everyone thought it was necessary because everybody else was there. The thing about remote work is now no one's there. So no one expects anyone to be in the same place as you. And it changed expectations and made more remote work okay. Um, Obviously, the pandemic's been a big legal issue for public company lawyers, as for every other branch of the loss. You know, suddenly you had many more things in your risk factors about, um, you know, about pandemics that never showed up before and explaining to the market how you're affected you know, effect about affected by that. I think the other thing I would say about the pandemic is it has not eliminated the fact that you need to have FaceTime. It has made FaceTime more purposeful. So you being there in the office every day, nobody cares about anymore. Spending the time, money, and energy to be in person is something that you do based on a choice of when is it that my business partners are also going to be there? When is it that not just being available by phone, but being available by down the hall is most valuable? When are you in those, when are you in those situations? 
for me, that's been a little more predictable. Um, and it's made it, it's, it's something you really have to think about before FaceTime was, of course, there's FaceTime, you're going to be there. And so is everybody else. Now it's all right, when do I want to be there? When does it make sense to spend the time and money to get to uh, the office, which is now for me a bit further away than before, uh, because it's going to be of the most use and value to my company. Um, and so that there's those changes, are the ones I've noticed. Uh, just one follow on to that. What, what has return to the office looked like uh, at your companies? Um, I, I, I can say for mine that we're, we're still waiting for return to the office. It's been continually pushed back uh, as a result of uh, now lately Omicron, uh, but that has been sort of subsiding. So now they finally told us that they're bringing us back uh, in March. Uh, I know that other places have been back probably for a year or more. Uh, so uh, uh, can you describe a little bit about what you're, what you're doing in terms of return to office uh, or have you always been back? Has it been full time? Has it been hybrid, which some companies are experimenting? Other companies have said, we're not bringing anyone back. Uh, so just curious as to what the, what the consensus is here. Yeah, so we took uh, one week off for COVID in March of 2020, and then everyone was back at it in the office uh, the whole time. So we are a, a funny mixture of things where probably three quarters of our company is in the office every day, um, either in San Francisco or in Columbus, Ohio. And then the other quarter of us work literally all over the world. So I think Mark's right. Um, when I am thinking about business travel to either our San Fran or Columbus offices, I'm really trying to hit a week where I know a lot of people are going to be in the office where it's gonna be really fruitful to have a ton of meetings. Um, and I'm not gonna to need to do the sort of like quiet, deep thinking um, legal research that that's really more conducive to doing at home. Um, but I do notice when I'm there, people do the, the drive-by and they'll ask you a question. And sometimes it's a really important question that takes several hours to solve. And you sort of wonder how many questions you miss when you're remote. My uh, my office has been back full time for over a year now, but we've we've left it up to individual discretion. So in a given week, I would say most employees work remotely, maybe once or twice. Um, given how much I travel, I I'm probably out a little more than uh, several other employees. But to echo these guys' sentiment, it doesn't obviate the need for FaceTime. It just means we want to be most efficient as possible with it. So for example, when I know the rest of either my legal colleagues or my football department is going to be in, those are the days that I make a, a greater effort to make sure I'm there. Great. Well, thank you for your perspective on that. Um, moving on to the next issue that we wanted to discuss. Uh, I, how does your view of the client and giving advice differ as in-house counsel versus in law firm practice. Uh, and, and Mark, I'm gonna look to you to start us off on that discussion. Well, I think it starts with the fact that as an in-house lawyer, you are constantly in front of your business partners. As an associate in a law firm, you're fighting to have any contact whatsoever with real human beings and usually losing. Um, and when you are in front of them, it's, it's different and it's special. When you're in-house, you're talking to the people who are your business partners, in essence, your clients, absolutely, all, absolutely all the time. Um, so you're you're doing in some respects what some of partners do, which is learning how to talk to business people. Except you're doing it all the time. Um, I think as um, as Kyle or or Alexander, no, no one no one pays you for the legal analysis. No one pays you for how brilliant the legal analysis is succinctness, plain English are extraordinarily important. And I'm, I'm not sure how well associates at law firms learn that. I don't, I don't think I learned that particularly well when I was an associate at a law firm. But when you're in-house, succinctness and plain English are absolutely essential. No one wants to read three paragraphs. They want to read three lines in an email, and it better start with, you know, yes, no, or um here are the things to think about, and we'll talk about it later. Um, it's 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 what's rewarded is the ability to communicate efficiently and quickly, 
not the ability to analyze, although you have to do that in order to give the advice. Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, I also think the extent to which, and, and you find this somewhat in law firm practice, but the extent to which you're a repeat player with the same client over and over again, um, impacts communication quite a bit because as you said, succinctness and make, there are certain people for me that I've, I've learned, hey, this type of ex explanation might not pass muster to them. They're going to ask these five questions. Let me just sort, short circuit it and get to the point uh, a little bit quicker. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a huge change in that respect because it's not like law firms don't have some of the same clients over and over. But when you talk about it, it's on a day-to-day -day basis that you're having those interactions, um, I think that level to which they're repetitive can really help. Okay, great. Uh, good discussion on that issue. Um, the next one that we have uh, is for Dennis. Uh, Dennis, do you want to talk about what the intersections are of business and legal considerations uh, in your role as, uh, as in-house counsel? Yeah, um, it's a good question, David. I feel like we, <clears throat> and obviously we've all touched on that a little bit because all of us are analyzing every question exactly <clears throat> with that frame, framework in mind. But I, I view it as <clears throat> Excuse me. I view it as there's a distinction between again. Maybe this is like building off on the previous question exactly, but outside counsel versus in-house counsel. The outside counsel has the perspective on here's the problem before me, right? Like in-house counsel somewhere asked me to do this thing. They were sued, or they want to merge, or they have a real estate they want to acquire, or they want to do something else, and there's a problem, and they want me to address it, and I'm going to go to work, and I'll build a team. And we're going to build a whole bunch of hours, hopefully, and, and, and address this problem that the company is facing. The in-house counsel, if it's doing its job correctly, is, is, is much more proactive, right? They're anticipating issues that come up. Like they're going to look so, like, especially when the general counsel has a seat at the C-suite level in a large company, or in my case, the general counsel is the C-suite, like is, is, the, is, is the decision maker. Um, you, you kind of know what the next one year, two year look like. And you, you approach your legal analysis a little bit with that in mind in a way that outside counsel cannot. So outside counsel cannot say, hey, guys, I just billed you for 100 hours because we really were proactive and we really thought about a, lot of, a bunch of problems that you haven't asked us to research, but please pay us for this work because we were proactive. Like, it doesn't happen. Like, you're going to get fired probably more than anything. In-house counsel, that's exactly what they do. Right? Like, that, that's your job in part. Sure, you're going you're gonna to put out a bunch of fires. You have the, like firefighter aspect of the job. But the other part of the job is you got to be the planner because the business is going to go in this direction and you got to plan and anticipate what the objections are. And so is this like reactive versus proactive thinking, which I mean, I think a lot about this, like um, this Daniel Kahneman book that I mentioned before about sort of level one, level two thinking. And uh, to me, it all comes down to if the in-house counsel who is taking business considerations too hard because he or she, you know, has to, that's the job, right? The job is to advance the business objective. It's not to go out and do a whole bunch of law as fun as it may be. Like nobody cares, like move the business forward. And as a result, you're going to be a lot more proactive in your job. And that's how you incorporate the really like the business considerations. And that's how you bring that into the work that you do, as opposed to just being a lawyer for the sake of being a lawyer, which nobody really hired you to be. I think Dennis hit on a really good point. The proactivity is really valued in-house um, in a way that it's harder for a law firm, given that economic model, you know, to value. And I, I'll give you a couple, you know, a case in point. Early on in my career, I made a point. You know, I was an employment lawyer. When when new rules came out from uh, the Department of Labor or the SEC regarding executive compensation, what have you, I made it my business. To, to read them the very day they came out and then to have something for my business partners the next day that gave, here are some practical implications of, of what this means for us. Um, I think a law firm, you probably do read them very quickly and then you come up with a client memo that in the end says, you know, businesses should keep in mind that, blah, blah, and which is great, that's all you can do. But when, when you're in house, I really took pride in being, this just came out I'm going to be the expert on it.
because I'm going to read it immediately and think a lot about it. And I'm going to make sure business partners know that I foresee some things they're going to have to think about and know when they have questions that, that they can come to me uh, and talk further about the, about those issues. Um, that I think is, is a, also another part of being, you know, of, of, of being in-house. You know, you don't want to be in a position where the business partner calls you and says, so what do you think of those, those new SEC regulations that just came out and you haven't seen them yet? You haven't read them. You don't know what's going on. You have to be really up to the minute and know how it affects, it could affect the business. Um, and if you're, if you're fortunate, you get to the business person before the business person gets to you um, with, with what's going on and what it can mean for, for the business. So you, you might have heard of the term uh, business informed legal advisor um, being applied to uh, a, a, an in-house lawyer. I, I mean, do you find uh, it, when comparing your prior life in, in law firm practice as opposed to in-house that you're evaluating a, um, a larger pool of risks than you were as an outside counsel, reputational risk, operational risk, credit risks to the company, things like that, expected to give that type of advice. Uh, is that sort of the primary demarcation between, uh, you know, being in-house as opposed to being external counsel? Yeah, I think that's, that, that's at least, I mean, that, that's a good encapsulation and it sort of explains why when I was leaving the government service, I couldn't go back to a law firm because as I tell people, I was like, you get spoiled because all of a sudden you're exposed to this like large set of issues and it's exciting because everything is on your plate. You own all of it. And so going back to a law firm where I'm thinking of my life then as like one case at a time, one legal issue at a time, one client at a time, just like seems not enough. You want more. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's, that's exactly what it comes down to, which is uh, you, you want to you wanna own the entire set of issues. And I was thinking about the earlier point too, David, um, you know, this, this, this demarcation between outside counsel and in-house counsel and what the, how do you force outside counsel to actually be better and to be proactive? And um, I used to think that it's a simple shift from the billable hour to retainer model. Like if you pay somebody $10,000 a month um, and they, they get to think creatively and they're going to deliver the kind of value that you otherwise don't get from them because they're like gun shy. They're not going to start billing you by the hour for the things you didn't ask because then you're not going to pay them for that. But if you pay them a retainer, well, then I've had a couple of counsel like that. And what you quickly find, at least in my experience, is that you put them on the retainer and they deliver a whole bunch of value at the beginning. And then they slow down because like they don't want to give you a whole bunch of stuff because then you, you, you get everything you want out of them and there's nothing left to do next month. And they wanna be retained next month and the month after that and for the next 10 years. So it's a challenge that I think to anybody who is listening to this, if you're outside counsel, to come up with a model that actually truly does the you know, like outsourced in-house counsel model, which some startup companies need because they can't afford a permanent general counsel. There's, it's not in the cost structure. They raised a bunch of money from venture capital they have maybe two, $3 million. Part of that is not to go hire an in-house counsel. So they need to find somebody outside who is gonna provide good proactive thinking for them. And it's a matter of figuring out what the right cost structure is for that. And I'm, I'm not sure we're there yet. Maybe some models that I just haven't seen yet, but that's, a, that's an interesting challenge as I'm thinking for like what outside counsel can do for in-house counsel to make themselves much more relevant. And what I, what I found it, the, the best relationships with outside counsel build toward a kind of partnership, lowercase p partnership. Uh, one example I can think of is um, we, working with uh, outside counsel for a long time on, on lots of transactions, capital markets transactions, securities transactions. And, and obviously those are, those are lucrative. Um, and the, the deal we made was we were going to pay a retainer that we could call them up anytime and ask for advice on day-to-day -day issues. And the retainer would cover everything and anything we asked. And both parties really benefited from that. Obviously, you know, we got expert advice on day-to-day -day issues that sometimes it's good to see, well, what is everybody else doing out there? Or a sounding board, like I think this is right. What the outside firm got was they were in the best position to be our deal counsel because they knew us best. Um, they had the advantage 
of knowing because we'd come to them with day to day issues of what's going on day to day. And it was a no brainer. Well, who's in the best position to represent us on this deal? Well, it, it you know, it's these guys. If we went to somebody else, we'd first have to educate them on what we're about and we'd have to build trust, um, you know, and and so forth that I have seen that work. But I, I agree with Dennis. It's not just, well, to have a retainer and everything will be fine. It, it needs to be strategic and it can work, but only if it's, in my view, a part of the relationship that helps you build upon it. And, and I think that that's a good segue into our next question, uh, which is, uh, what are your primary considerations when retaining outside counsel? And I know that there are are probably outside counsel in our audience today who are always clamoring at the doorstep of in-house counsel to try to, you know, get their foothold into the company, get your business. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in certain cases, that's much needed uh, in areas where uh, the in-house attorney either, you know, doesn't have the expertise uh, or, or simply doesn't have the resources to handle uh, a particular project. Uh, uh, so I uh, would like the group's perspective in general uh, on what are the considerations that go into how you select uh, law firms to do the type of work that you need them to do. Uh, Kyle, why don't we start with you on that one? Sure. So I, Mark hit the nail on the head, right? The, the relationship resembling a lowercase p partnership, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. You know, over the years, we've built up... Um, a good network of attorneys that, that we work with. But when we're uh, investigating a new matter or something that we haven't uh, um, tackled yet, of course, you know, it's, it's kind of the inverse of what we discussed earlier, where having a, a niche legal knowledge is to your detriment as an in-house attorney. Well, that's often what I'm looking for in my external guy, where I say, hey, look, we're, we're an inch deep and a mile wide. I need you to go a mile deep on this. Um, uh, past that, I, you know, the communication existing to the point that I can explain the context of what we're looking for and know that the person is internalizing that as they undergo their analysis. Like I said, it's, you know, every industry is unique and, and some of the needs that are going to come up are so hyper specific to what it is that you do. And, you know, for us, often when I'm looking for outside counsel, I'm really looking more on behalf of my client than I am me. So when I'm doing that, it's often, hey, does he have or she have any experience in the sports world and the entertainment world? Are they going to understand these concerns that I'm bringing up about um, kind of the bigger picture here? So I want them to be obviously a subject matter expert, but also somebody who can really take the business concerns I'm throwing at them um, into account. And, and ultimately, that just comes down to uh, being a great communicator and someone who's going to keep us abreast of what's going on. I, I it's not my personality type to say, hey, you take it, and then they just run with it. I, I want to be involved every step of the way. And I think, um, yeah, that, that makes for the best external counsel. And again, for us, that's usually just looking to our network and to people who we trust or people who we trust the people that they trust. So, uh, but, but again, I think Mark's point was probably a better answer to this question than mine. Yeah, from, I mean, look, from my perspective, and this is hard to find or hard to screen for um, ahead of time. But if you find an outside counsel like that, you, uh, you hold on to them and you, <laughs> you don't let them go, you keep coming back to them. And that is, it's people who are, who are experts in their field, but they have the mentality that, interesting, I've been looking at the statute this way for the past 30 years, but you're actually causing me to think anew about this particular element of it. And I'm willing to explore that with you because we as, we as in-house counsel who are generalists who don't know this particular field, we sometimes have inside that we're not restricted. We don't have the blinders that this is our area of expertise. And therefore, we can actually bring the perspective that ultimately ends up in not necessarily changing the law wholesale, but it allows outside counsel to say, hmm, interesting, I haven't thought about this before. And it's, again, I don't know how you screen for that because it's not as though you can, like, if you call them up and if you ask them, hey, are you willing to think outside the box? They're going to say, yes, we all do. Like, didn't you read my website bio? It says right there, I think outside the box, like I'm an out of the box thinker. They all say that about themselves. Very few actually are <laughs> because by and large, their existence is being very successful operating in this narrow subject matter expertise field. And they don't necessarily think of like, oh, 
well, here's a new approach to things. This is not how I've done things before. If you find people like that who are willing to be uncomfortable, so to speak, in their own field by re-examining things from a new angle, that's a, that's a rare outside counsel, but it's a very valuable one. Okay, great. Thank you for that discussion on outside counsel. Um, I'm going to begin to pepper in some audience questions into uh, uh, the other questions we have for the time remaining. Uh, so the next one that we have is, uh, what advice do you have for attorneys looking to move in-house from law firm or government practice? Uh, what legal and personal skills do you look for when you recruit lawyers to your in-house team? Uh, and uh, what is the adjustment like uh, into the corporate setting? And what barriers to entry uh, might there be for an attorney looking to move in-house? Uh, why don't we uh, flip that one to Dennis? So I don't know if you guys ever ever know or listen to like Supreme Court arguments where Justice Breyer is asking questions. So there's like nine questions and you've no idea what to respond to. And you're like, oh, I'm going to answer part one of your nine part questions. That's You remind me of that a little bit, David. Not not to uh, not to analogize from you to Justice Breyer. I feel like I've, I've done some some damage to you right now, but I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the I mean, look, it uh, one advice is to listen to this. But this is actually a great discussion. Like I wish I I had this panel before I was considering it because there's so much good stuff here. Not from me, but there's like three other people who really like thought about this stuff and and really provide good answers. But from my perspective, I'll, in addition to listening to the panel, do a couple of things. One. Uh, get get like get uncomfortable. Get comfortable being uncomfortable is is what the best way to put it. Because in the law firm, again, you're trained to be really really good at this one thing, and you're gonna you're gonna like you're gonna be a appellate lawyer, which is really a broad field. But at the end of the day, you're good at writing briefs that present arguments succinctly to to judges. If you do real estate, you're you're really good at analyzing lease contracts and everything else, and looking at that particular area of the law. As a general counsel, as a generalist, you're going to be like, you're going to be drinking from the fire hose, whatever expression you want to find, you're going to be super uncomfortable because you're going to be going home at the end of the day and you're going to be thinking, you're going to be laying there at night thinking, did I just screw up like 10 different answers that I had to give to people? Because like, did I get that right? Like, I really don't know this area very well. I was given five minutes to do this analysis, quote unquote, like you got to be really uncomfortable and you have to be okay with that level of discomfort. Uh, and if you if you if you really want everything to be 100% certain, I'd say don't go in house <laughs> because you're you're it's not gonna it's it's not gonna be that that way for you at all. So so learn to get be okay with being uncomfortable. Uh, the other one is what I said earlier about like fighting for your right to so slow down. Like take that perspective, whatever you go in house in the government in the in the corporate sector. Um, Make sure that you you stand you stand up for yourself, and this is more like a personal thing, I guess. But like, you gotta you gotta stand up for your like your belief that you are there not to provide instinctive answers. You're there to actually do legal analysis. They're, they hate it. They're paying you to give them quick answer that says yes, I can go and sell this product in this way, or I get to build the product around Bitcoin and do whatever else. Like that's what they they want. But you have to educate them. Like you have to stand up for yourself as a lawyer. You have to explain to people that there is this professionalism aspect that's drilled into you, that you know you cannot commit malpractice. There's all sorts of there's any number of ways to explain it. But the very simple point is that you have to protect your own ability to give legal advice because legal advice does require you to slow down, um, whether it's for five minutes or for one day or one week. You have to you have to fight for that. And the last thing I'd say is. Um, don't worry about like people are going to say, well, you're not coming from MA or private equity or some corporate practice. So you can go in house as a litigator. Like, what are they going to do with you in house? And I'd say put that out of your mind completely because, like, for one, there are areas like in large corporations, they will have associate general counsel for litigation matters. So, like, there's a clear path to in house from being a litigator. But a good company, like, in our case, when I will hire general counsel at some point when we raise the next round of funding and it's it shouldn't be me anymore, it should be somebody else actually doing the work, 10 times out of 10, I will take a very, very smart lawyer who knows nothing about insurance, like the core of what we do. I don't actually care about that aspect. I care about the person who comes in and says, I am like, I'm willing to do all those things I said before. I'm, I'm okay being uncomfortable, but I will I'll be there with you guys with the whiteboard thinking creatively about like legal issues 
and trying to go in the direction that the business wants to go, because that's not something law firms teach. And, and that's a rare thing. Whereas I can find people who know insurance law, like that's not a hard thing. Like I can, I can screen for that. I can hire somebody like that, but 10 times out of 10, I'm not going to care about your subject matter expertise. I'm going to care about a whole bunch of other things that they don't necessarily teach you in law school or train in a law firm. I, I remember when I was hired as a general counsel in the governor's office, the person who hired me said, yeah, we actually weren't sure what to do with you because like, what do you do with an appellate lawyer? In the counsel's office, we, we, I mean, we have we have an attorney general's office. They have solicitor general. They're going to do appellate cases. So, like, it's not obvious what we would do with you. But the discussion was around like how it actually turned out to be. I mean, this is self-aggrandizing, but from their perspective, they were telling me it turned out to be a good decision because it, you get you get a guy who is think who is like trained in a law firm setting to think about issues that they've never seen before, and they have to quickly get up to speed. So maybe my pitch is. Become an appellate lawyer if you want to go in house, which is kind of weird, and I'm not sure I can really say that, but maybe I don't know. So um, it's an interesting question, David. Um, this is what sort of the process, the way I think about the process, um, in terms of subject matter expertise of what I need, I look for that on on paper. <clears throat> um, when I'm looking at resumes, um, I'm look. That's when I'm looking for subject matter expertise. By the time I've decided to talk to somebody, that's no longer a question in my mind. I wouldn't be talking to the person if I wasn't convinced. What I'm looking for in, in terms of talking to a prospective team member is first, that person being a team player and um, knowing how to control um, his or her his or her ego. Uh, you do everything as a team in-house. And if you have the mentality of a solo or a um, uh, someone who is looking for individual glory, that's it's very, very hard to succeed. And it's a very quick way to blow up your team if you hire somebody like that. Um, that's one reason, by the way, I've always had team members interview a prospective new team member and always given the team members a large voice in, in at least as, as large as mine. What do you think? You know, will this person you know, fit in as, an, as another team member? Um, in talking to the person, I'm looking for, for flexibility, um, the ability to develop judgment and and apply expertise and to learn from experience. So I'll you know I'll ask questions about, you know, tell me a time when 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 you uh, when you had to deliver advice to a client that the client didn't want to hear. Um, tell me about a time when you when you developed um, legal advice and then learned later on that there was an aspect of it you you know you hadn't you hadn't considered. I will almost always ask a question about the subject matter expertise, but it's not it's not a fastball. It's sort of a sinker or a curveball. It'll ask uh, for applying some aspect to a, like a current issue that is being talked about in a way that is intended to separate somebody who can who really understands the issues and can apply them versus somebody who's going to spit back. This is what the rule says. And the person who spits back what the rule says is, is not going to be as highly valued as somebody who says, yeah, you know, the way you might handle that is you might do this and this and has certain advantages, this and this under the rule, but you have to look out for this and this other rule as well. So it, it depends upon what your priority is and what, how you think the things are going to fit together in the future. Not, well, you know, the rule says X, Y, and Z. So, you know, I, I would apply the rule and, and just do that. Um, that's sort of some of the things that I, that I look for when I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, who to hire for an open position. I, I laughed a little bit. I asked the exact same question when we're interviewing about, can you give me an example of a time you gave a client an answer they might not have wanted to hear or a partner an answer they might not have wanted to hear? And I think it it dovetails exactly with what Dennis was saying, Com comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Have you been in those situations where you're, um, you know, you're not a yes uh, man or woman, you're not a rubber stamp where you're able to kind of learn and, and explain what's going on to everybody. So that's, I was chuckling at that because I, I think that's probably a universal thing. Yeah, so uh, it, just thinking about some of the younger lawyers uh, and, and maybe even law students that uh, might be uh, in the audience today, uh, you know, who uh, uh, might be thinking about an in-house career path uh, you know, I know back in the day when I when I started uh, 22 years ago uh, in house, I was kind of a, a unicorn because uh, uh, the, the the general rule was well, you know, you don't get in house unless if you've been practicing out in 
the law firm world or, or elsewhere, uh, you know, for maybe a decade, uh, you know, because in-house uh, legal departments were only looking for highly experienced uh, uh, attorneys. I, I think that that world has largely changed uh, in that time. And now we're seeing in-house legal departments, even at large corporations, uh, hiring younger attorneys. Uh, it, you know, is that your experience? And, uh, uh, you know, what would you say to a younger attorney or, or even a law student thinking about an in-house career, how quickly they might be able to ramp up to uh, be able to get into that type of position? So I can start. I think I am probably the youngest member here, which just speaks to my lack of experience. Um, but to me, it was actually really valuable to sort of um, stay on the path and clerk and spend some time at a big law firm and, and kind of grind it out. Um, I always tell people, you're lucky because you went to law school, which is shorter than med school, and you don't have to do a residency. Uh, but if you do a residency, you should think of it as your clerkship and big law time, and you'll be better compensated and have better hours than your friends who are in their medical residency. Um, and to me, I, I just didn't know when I was a 2L or a 3L, um, you know, that one day I'd be the director of regulatory affairs for a Bitcoin company, right? And and you just can't plan for that. Um, and so I think learning, because so much of the in-house practice is um, on a, a condensed timeline, even if you do a great job to Dennis's point of fighting for um, your right to slow things down and to double check, there are some times where it's more important to be correct and sometimes where it's more important to have a decent answer now. Um, and so you just can't do that when you're fresh out of law school. Um, or you, if you're going to go in-house, it needs to be at a big established company where you have people um, you can learn from. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of two attorneys at River and I handle sort of the government regulatory side so all of the predictive forward thinking, staying up on the legal news, all of that is is on me. It's And I couldn't have done it straight out of law school. So I do think there's a lot of wisdom in developing some legal skills, um, particularly if you want to position yourself to be a generalist. It's hard to jump into that um, if you've got a lot of really niche expertise or if you're sort of fresh out of out of law school. Great. Any other thoughts on that one? Uh, yeah, I would tease out, David, just the, the, the portion of what Alexander said about um, it has to do with mentorship. Like it's on you to find the, to make sure that somebody's going to mentor you wherever you go right out of law school. And that probably means that coming to a company like ours, even if we're willing to hire you out of law school, doesn't mean that you should want to work for us. Because I'm not going to like, the only reason I'm hiring you is because I don't want to think about this stuff anymore. I'm not going to be, we're a five people company. I'm not going to be sitting there thinking, what is the, you know, good career development for this person? I'm just going to assume that, you know, the legal stuff, you like you own the stuff, go, go force and, and multiply. So if you're going to work in house out of law school, I think it's got, it's got to be a large company that has the structure set up where yes, we bring in young attorneys, we mentor them, we actually give them the kind of the kinds of things that they're owed as, as our obligation is to mentor junior lawyers. And that's going to be more rare, like it's going to be an exception rather than the rule, I think, in in-house shops, as opposed to in a law firm, which for better or for worse, like law firms get the bad rap. But what they do well is they bring in a lot of young attorneys and they they mentor them. They, you may disagree with the way that they do the mentorship, but they do mentor them. There is a law lawyer development plan that law firms have because at the end of the day, they do think some of you are going to be partners and business owners of the law firm. So this is actually on them to, to mentor you the whole way. Now, David, I, I found that um, career and talent development is actually a much bigger part of, of my experience as being an, an in-house lawyer than it was at the law firm. Maybe the, uh, maybe the model of training at, at the law firms is more like child abuse, but um what I've experienced is I, the talent development, career development is part of what I do every day in working with the people on my team and the other people um, with whom I work at the company. Um, I have in, in some ways, I guess, the luxury in that I'm not, a, uh, you know, I'm not the only attorney and, and that that probably plays into it. But if I was, you know, it, if I was going in-house at a 
at a place that had more than one or two attorneys, I really would want to know that they're going to they're going to they're going to understand that I'm interested in developing my career and they're going to care about that and that a leader has that as part of his or her job description. Um, I, and Dennis, I understand, you know, when you're one person, you brought, you're hiring the second person, there's no time for that. Completely understand that. Um, but I think it's a much bigger part, especially being a leader and manager um, in, in-house. Everything I do every day, there's always a talent and career development aspect to what I'm doing, including when working with colleagues and thinking about what I can do to help them to understand what I do better and how we can work together better as partners. Great. And with that, I, I think we are at the end of our time. I want to thank all of our panelists today for a phenomenal discussion. Uh, we really appreciate your participation uh, and uh, insight on this topic. Uh, and before we close, I just wanted to give one more plug uh, for our in-house counsel symposium. Uh, again, the, the details on that are May 14th uh, of this year, 2022, at the Union League Club in Chicago. Keynote address will be by the Honorable William Barr, former uh, U.S. Attorney General and General Counsel of Verizon Communications. Uh, we hope that uh, everyone will be able to join us for that event. Uh, registration information should be coming out to uh, the FedSoc email distributions uh, in the very near future and on the FedSoc National website. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like you to thank you all for joining uh, and uh, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.